Hello, everybody. My name is Oli Ben. I am the Director of Philanthropy and Social Impact for the Jewish Community Foundation. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I want to let you know this session is being recorded. Uh, we will send out a link afterwards um, and provide you with some additional resources um, of relevance to today's subject as well. Um, also, we wanted to take a second to acknowledge what's happening in Israel right now. We've witnessed renewed scenes of rockets, violence, and death and we ask for a rapid end to the confrontation and pray for um, no more innocent lives being lo lost. Um, um, I will we'll just introduce the Jewish Community Foundation really briefly because I know we have some new folks on, the, uh, on today's call, which is fantastic. Um, at the Jewish Community Foundation, we believe that every individual has the power to make a difference and that together we can change the world. Since our inception, we are the largest grant maker in San Diego, facilitating over $1.7 billion in grants. Uh, and we currently manage over $650 million in assets on behalf of individuals, families, and organizations. We facilitate their philanthropy, match their special interests, and provide personalized granting services. A large part of our mission is to inspire and educate our community on issues important to them. And we do that in a variety of ways. First, we want to help donors respond to urgent needs when they arise. Um, if you're a fund holder, you will have received several of our no act give emails like these in your inboxes recently with ideas for how your philanthropy can play a part in solving pressing challenges. Um, if you're not receiving these emails for any reason, please let us know. Um, additionally, um, and this is open to everybody, we uh, read widely and want to keep you informed on what's hot in nonprofits, the world of philanthropy and Jewish causes in San Diego and beyond. Um, if you're not yet receiving our regular curated reading list, just put your name in the chat and we'll add you to the list. This is free and open to the entire community. Um, additionally, our educational series like today, Access to Insight in Depth is in full swing for the year, as you can see. The purpose of this series is to inspire, educate, and bring you access to incredible thought leaders across the nonprofit and philanthropic landscapes. Um, in addition to our teen mental health series, which you can find on our website and on YouTube, um, this Newish and Jewish series, um, you can also look for a very special access to insight in the next few months where we'll be announcing a major new JCF initiative around homelessness. And then indigenous leader, Ega Villanueva, will be speaking in July about his thought leadership and philanthropy and our important connection with indigenous communities. Finally, we just wanted to say thank you to the many JCF fund holders on this call who have referred individuals and families to us for their philanthropic planning. You can open a donor advised fund at JCF with as little as $1,800. And we are so grateful to our current fund holders for introducing their networks to JCF and helping us support individuals and families making a difference so that together we can change the world. Okay, so on to today's topic. Um, and I will tell you, I've been very excited about this one. This access to insight is all about Jewish life and Jewish engagement. The goals are to show how organizations build, adapt, sustain, and grow different Jewish communities. Today's session focuses on our local Jewish communities in California, and later this summer, we'll be highlighting some amazing organizations in Israel. Now, in framing this about adapting and sustaining Jewish life and Jewish engagement, I want to acknowledge the year that every Jewish organization has had. Uh, there has been some unbelievable work, pivots, and innovating that every shul, community organization, and service provider has done during the pandemic, and we want to recognize that work. Uh, additionally, many long established organizations have been highly creative and adaptable even before the pandemic. This conversation today is meant to build on the great work already being done here and to highlight a diverse range of experiences um, and people thinking about the future of Jewish life and community. So with that, I'd love to introduce our moderator, Karen Perry. Karen is the executive director of Hillel of San Diego. Before joining Hillel, Karen worked most recently at the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle. Um, a San Diego native, Karen was the education director at Temple of Dath Shalom uh, before having various teen engagement roles at the Lawrence Family JCC. Karen's part of the Wexner Field Fellowship, a prestigious, uh, which is a prestigious exec executive leadership program, and she was previously honored as a Women of Valor at the San Diego Jewish Arts Festival. Um, and I'll just add that while Karen is relatively new to the position, she has stewarded Hillel through some big challenges in her first year, 
and is building a magnificent future for Jewish college students in San Diego. So with that, Karen, I will turn it over to you to introduce our uh, subject and our and our panelists. Thank you, Ollie. That was such a, a nice welcome, and um, I am honored to be here. I just I I have to say that the news and images from Israel lately elicit a wide range of feelings and thoughts about being Jewish in the world. I know our students at the um, universities are really feeling it, and I I want to acknowledge the crisis and share my heartfelt wishes for peace and for the safety of our family and friends in Israel. And I also really wanna thank JCF for hosting this forum. JCF has been an incredible partner for us and it is is truly a model for communities around the country. I know because in Seattle, we looked to JCF to see how things are done. Um, and so it's such an honor to be a part of this program today with all of you. As Ollie said, I'm Karen Perry. I'm the executive director of Hillel of San Diego, and I have been since October of 2020. So I started running the organization in the middle of the pandemic, which has been um, full of wonderful opportunities. And we serve students at SDSU, UC San Diego, USD, and Cal State San Marcos. So some of you may be asking why someone from Hillel, a very traditional institution, would be facilitating a conversation about newish in the Jewish communal space. Well, I like to say that we're a 98-year-old startup. Our population regenerates every four years, and so, so does our organization. We're constantly evolving and shifting how we do business in order to respond to the changing needs of every new cohort of emerging adults that come through our Hillels. So um, as I think you'll hear from these incredibly innovative leaders in the field of Jewish life, thinking outside the box and using challenges as a framework for inventing effective ways to connect and inspire is really the only way that Hillel is able to thrive continually for students year after year. The organization is not the same organization it was when I was at UCSD as a student, and it won't be the same organization in 10 years for that generation of students. Um, so while we remain steadfast in our vision to, um, to ensure that every Jewish college student has a relationship with Israel, with Jewish life and with learning, um, the way we do our work uh, dramatically shifts and evolves in response to the needs of the current students. So it, I, I like to think of it as like the best of both worlds, constantly evolving and shifting. Um, not anchored to any one type of traditional Jewish engagement strategy, but also knowing when tradition counts um, and having those, those anchoring traditions. Um, this is why I'm so excited to introduce this panel today, because each of them also are anchored in tradition while just challenging the status quo and what it means to really build Jewish community. Um, if you'd like to ask a question during the program, feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll make sure to try to filter it into the conversation. And so with that, I'm so excited to introduce our panel. Um, they're all rock stars like in their own right and, and together as um, in conversation, like just strap in because it's very exciting. Uh, Rabbi Gabby uh, Arad was born in Israel and moved to America at age seven. She grew up in South Florida, where her mother was the director of education at a large reform synagogue. Gabby uh, was immersed in the reform movement's youth groups, summer camps, and young leaders programs, and at age 20, attended Hebrew Union College to pursue her career in clergy. Not wanting, I love this part, not wanting to choose between being a cantor and a rabbi, Gabby worked with the school to create a program that allowed her to do both. Already innovating. Um, in the early 2000s, she was invested as a cantor and ordained as a rabbi. She continued her immersion in the reform movement, working in large synagogues in New York and DC. Uh, while she loved the reform movement, she always knew she was gathering experience and knowledge to one day create her own niche in the Jewish progressive community. In 2014, Gabby founded the Jewish Collaborative of San Diego with a small group of people also looking to create something different. Gabby knows the collection of experience and knowledge is an ongoing, ever-ending process, especially when it comes to leading a community. In the past seven years, she has been involved in Gamliel, a faith-based community organizing network, the San Diego Interfaith Minstrel uh, Ministerial, sorry. Um, I mean, you could be singing too, but no association and the Oceanside Homeless Resource and is a certified coach and instructor with Your Infinite Life Training and Coaching Company. Gabby lives in La Costa with her two kids, Noah and Blake, and Jayco is also located in that neighborhood. 
Jenny Cammy is the foundation, uh, Leash Tag Foundation's Chief Talent Officer, where she is responsible for leveraging Leash Tag Commons as a physical platform to enhance collaboration, creativity, and connection. Jenny oversees the foundation's organizational development strategy, as well as Hive programming, which I'm sure you'll hear more about, including co-working, professional development, and arts and culture. Prior to joining Leash Tag, Jenny worked for Jewish Family Service of San Diego as the North County Outreach Social Worker, where she worked to reduce the barriers to accessing both local Jewish life and community resources. Jenny holds an MSW from San Diego State University and a BA in Human Development from Connecticut College. She started her social work career at the Community Resource Center in Encinitas, where she provided individual, couples, and group therapy for community members, as well as residents of the agency's domestic violence shelter. She's a proud Encinitas resident where she lives with her husband and two children. And Rabbi Zelig Golden, um, last but not least, uh, has a vision for a thriving earth-based Jewish tradition developed out of a lifetime of nature connection, Jewish leadership, and commitment to environmental advocacy. Zelig invokes mentorship, facilitation, and ceremonial tools to guide an annual cycle of land-based festivals nature-based rites of passage and mentorship for emerging leaders. Zelig received rabbinic ordination from Aleph, uh, Alliance for Jewish Renewal, supported by the Wexner Graduate Fellowship, and was previously ordained uh, Magid by Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi of Blessed Memory. He holds a master's in Jewish studies from the Graduate Theological Union, and he previously worked as an environmental lawyer protecting food and farms and has long guided works uh, groups into the wilderness, which feels very on brand for you. So last week, the five of us, including Ollie Ben, who is a remarkable leader in his own right, got together to chat about the program and um, wow, the conversation was so incredible and so insightful. We all were like, let's just keep talking. Um, so today we're gonna, we're gonna do that. Uh, we're gonna frame this session very similarly as, as a fishbowl conversation where you'll get to hear from Rabbi Gabby, Rabbi Zelig and Jenny about the possibilities for the future of Jewish communal gathering. Again, if you have questions while we're talking, feel free to pop them in the chat. So with that, maybe each of you can start by sharing a bit about your organization and maybe how you flipped the traditional model. Rabbi Gabby, we can start with you. Thank you, Karen. Um, flip the traditional model. So for, for me, the traditional model was the reform movement. That's what I grew up in and that's what I was accustomed to. Um, and I think it was the top down model that I was trying to flip on its head, uh, the hierarchy that exists within um, a lot of synagogues. Um, let me also say, I have nothing against it. There's, there's, I believe that there's a place for all of us and the more organizations and institutions um, that exist, the better for us as a wider Jewish community. So let me preface that. Um, for me, it was uh, working in the reform movement and working in all these large synagogues, there was something missing. There was this community aspect that was missing. You'd have like little groups of community, um, but it was the engagement was really limited to where they were engaged within the community. So there, were, there weren't a lot of like inter, inter blending of those communities. So we wanted to switch turn it on its head, uh, take the top down model and make it more of this like open circle um, where we have different access points for people to come into the uh, community. And it's a community that is run by the community. So I like to call it organic Judaism. It's, it's, it's an ever evolving community um, led by its members. Um, and when we first started, it felt a lot like a kibbutz. Um, and now we like to call ourselves a mishkan. Everybody brings their gifts and everybody brings their talents and their, oh, and this is a perfect example. Um, why I like this picture is because in let's say a traditional synagogue, when it's time to bless someone for a special occasion, um, they're called up to the bima and the rabbi and the cantor offer them a blessing. In our congregation, we all bless each other. 
Um, I, of course, I'm the spiritual leader. I guide, I lead in that respect. Um, but it's the kind of community where we all have access to uh, blessing each other, to Torah, to um, our own beliefs on what is within our tradition. And I'll end with saying that at Jayco, what we love to say is that there's no wrong way to be Jewish. Um, and, and we want everyone to be able to access Judaism from, from their perspective. I love that. Jenny, you wanna take it from here? Sure. <clears throat> So the Hive at Leech Tide Commons, for those who don't know, is, um, as Karen said in her beautiful intro, our Center for Collaboration, Connection, and Creativity. And I think how we flip things on its head is that it really, the Hive has evolved so organically and really based on human-centered design. So the origins of the Hive is that it started as a space for Leech Tide Foundation grantees that were all focused in a similar area, which is building vibrant Jewish life in North County, to co-locate together, to really push collaboration in a way that's different when you have to call your colleague who works you know, a few miles away and schedule a meeting to be together. What happens when you put those heads around a table together and there's really positive eavesdropping going on as you're planning programs? And as the hive evolved, we realized why are we keeping this group to this bubble of North County Jewish Life grantees? We could benefit, there, there were organizations, other, um, nonprofits in the North County community asking for space in the hive. And so we said, okay, there's a need for this. People are expressing a need, let's grow. And so we grew, that was sort of our first outreach of growth. And then, you know, because we are very much grounded as a Jewish co-working space, we really wanted for our, our hive members, whether they identify as Jewish or not, to, to have a place for Jewish exploration in their co-working space. We're really beyond, you know, the we work where we are intentionally building community. And so what happened with that while we were celebrating holidays and doing Jewish learning together, again, why are we, why are we limiting it to this group of people? There was clearly a need in the community for people who are interested in other Jewish touch points. And I just want to amplify and echo what Gabby said about certainly not being um, against or you know an alternative to a traditional institution. I see us all working so much in concert together and sort of on a spectrum of Jewish opportunities um, in San Diego. Um, and so the hive had kind of organically grew. And you know, even from something as simple as the kitchen in the hive was this small area. And my incredible mentor supervisor of blessed memory, Naomi Rabkin was like, well, we can't have a gathering space in this small area, knock the wall down. Like people wanna be in here, let's open up the kitchen, knock the wall down. Actually, we knocked the wall down to my private office as well and made that a whole kitchen area. And wow, did that change things? And she said, you know, we always buy the expensive coffee machine and people will come. If you build it, they will come. And that was certainly the truth with the hive. Um, and so, you know, again, we kind of expanded our ring more and more. And, um, and now we are really this, you know, hoping to bring back to life soon, this vibrant place where people can explore different expressions of Judaism. And I really look at us as, as a gateway into the Jewish community, maybe for those who have never felt the door was open to them and that our jobs is to help steward them on wherever their path may go next, whether that's continuing to coming to Hive events or introducing them to Gabby and Jayco, um, or to connect them to Coastal Roots Farm, which we are co-located with, our wonderful Jewish community farm. I think this picture kind of says it all. This we partnered with one table for a Shabbat experience. And it was just, you know, you can't understate the value of the beautiful physical platform that we have to achieve our goals. Great. Rabbi Zali. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Karen and Ollie and uh, Jenny and Gabby. It sounds like we're, we're birds of a feather in many ways. Um, one way that we're not, though, is that I'm not in San Diego. Um, Wilderness Torah is um, based in the Bay Area. Um, I live in Occidental, north of the Bay Area, with my wife and two kids. And um, Wilderness Torah's mission is to awaken and celebrate the Earth-based traditions of Judaism. And we do that through multi-generational community festivals. For example, Sukkot on a farm or Passover in the desert. Uh, and Passover in the desert incidentally is closer to San Diego than it is to San Francisco, so it's considered. Um, and secondarily, we do um, youth 
Sunday school in the forest and a nature-based bar and bat mitzvah rite of passage. Um, and there's a few ways that we're, we're, we're evolutionizing Judaism, you might say. One is that everything we do is outdoors. Um, you know, we believe uh, that uh, part of uh, the rich 2000 years of, of wandering is, you know, it was also a, a, a challenge of being disconnected from the nature-based roots of our peoplehood, of our traditions. Um, and now we have the opportunity to do that anywhere we are and really connect to the natural world. In modernity, uh, we live with a, a crisis of disconnection. There are lots of studies about that. So one of, one of the switches is really being outside. Here's a, an image of Sukkot on the farm, Havdalah from a few years ago. Another way that we're, we're flipping things, and I think that this is one of the ways we are birds of a feather, um, is that we're doing uh, community-driven, people-centered community building and education. So if it's in the community festivals, like you saw at Sukkot on the farm, you know, although I'm the executive director and rabbi, um, I'm mentoring people, but really the leadership is coming from within the community. And when Sukkot's happening or Passover is happening, I'm not actually leading hardly anything. Um, and you have, you know, a 16 person village council driving the creation and the five day experience within our youth programs. And this is perhaps one of the most exciting things I think we're doing um, is that, you know, we're really thinking about education differently. Um, and instead of thinking about education as putting information uh, towards people or into people, we're really asking the question, what is your inherent wisdom? Uh, what are your passions and gifts? And so we use a mentorship model to really draw out of people um, that which they are excited about. Of course, using Judaism as a container, as a framework, the, the prayers and the ceremonies and the stories from the Torah and the holidays and the Hebrew calendar in particular to, to, to connect us. But then the questions within that, how do you show up? Um, how can we um, you know, invite you into your leadership? Um, and just an invitation, Wilderness Torah is now going to be creating uh, its long envisioned, uh, since we founded set 14 years ago, the Center for Earth-Based Judaism, embedding our organization inside of Camp Newman in the hills of Sonoma County after having burned down in the 2017 Tubbs Fire. They are now rebuilding a beautiful new camp and retreat center and Wilderness Torah is going to be building a, an Earth-Based Center inside of that to continue doing our work uh, regionally and also training uh, and expanding um, the ethos of Wilderness Torah internationally. So I look forward to partnering with, uh, with y'all. So cool. So all of these organizations are really um, so intentional about investing in Jewish life in a really um, communal based way. And you all kind of brought up, um, you know, having a relationship with traditional Jewish organizations. So um, for this next kind of conversation starter, feel free to jump in and chime in with each other. Um, but, you know, from startup mode for a new institutional design, what synergy do you see between newer organizations like each of yourselves, although I don't, I would argue that they're not so new anymore and more traditional 98 year old uh, Jewish organizations. Jenny, if you wanna start, cause I think you see a lot of that at the hive and then kind of I'll feed in. Yeah, I mean, I think we see ourselves as a laboratory for that and really invite other organizations. And in fact, you know, when the property was first purchased by the Leech Tag Foundation, we really looked to community organizations to activate the space because we didn't have the staff built out at that time uh, to, to create our own programming like we do now. And so, I mean, we've had incredible partnerships, whether it be with, you know, Hillel and the JCC, um, the Lipinski Jewish Arts Festival. I mean, I think these kind of anchor and, and Jewish family service. I mean, I could go on and on about the organizations, but the idea is you have this playground, you have a 67 acre agricultural playground. How can that enhance what you're doing within your walls of your organization? And for Purim this year, a great example, you know, the Lipinski Jewish Arts Festival um, created a Purim play all around the property um, that people could drive through so it was COVID safe in their cars and have an experience of live theater that was outside of what you would traditionally, you know, see in a, in a, you know, in a theater setting. Um, and so we welcome those kind of partnerships. We welcome a synagogue reaching out and saying, we want to bring our congregation there and we want to have a Havdalah on the lawn as the sun sets. Absolutely. And how can we, because I said, I think our 
mission and imperative is to expose the people who come to the Hive to the options in the Jewish community. So when we partner like that, we can say to people who come to Hive events, get a taste of JCO, get a taste of Temple Solal, get a taste of Hillel, see what their programs are like. Um, and vice versa, you know, for Temple Solal to come and say, here's what the Hive community looks like. How can you engage with us? So I think the opportunities are really limitless. I think finding ways I have found, even as a, as a member of a synagogue, when you can engage with the members of your community outside the walls of your institution, it suddenly feels like a real community when your community doesn't only just happen when you're in that physical space. And so I really hope that the Hive and Leech Tide Commons and Coastal Roots Farm, all of us, can be that place to just build on that sense of Jewish community. I love that you mentioned the word playground. Um, I had that in my notes also, because that's, that's, I feel like if we're going to engage the members, if we're going to engage Jews in general, um, to have that sense that they can come in and really try out whatever it is that they want to try out. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I think that if we're talking about connection and, and, what I was used to, what I was used to is a lot of competition between synagogues and organizations and they didn't wanna share information. Um, and so when we started out as a Jewish playground, I mean, we made it clear, we're gonna try this out and anyone who wants information, anyone who wants programs, I've had people call me and ask me to explain how our Hebrew lab works. And I said, absolutely, here you go take whatever you need, right? Like, because to have the vision as Jewish leaders of saying, if one of us succeeds, we all succeed. If we can come from that place, um, then it's just opening the door for all of us to connect. And I think for us being in organizations that do have, I'm gonna say the freedom, to uh, create that Jewish playground, to uh, see what works and see what doesn't work, that allows us to share our findings with the rest of the Jewish community. Um, and I, I, that's what I want for the wider Jewish community, to have that open flow of communication and sharing information and just not seeing it as, um, as a way to like, we need to get members, we need to get money. And so if you're taking members, that's less members for us. It doesn't, it doesn't need to work that way. Can I jump on one thing you said really quickly, Gabby, just um, from a funding perspective, you said having the freedom to play and let's be honest and like name what's in the room is that organizations need funding to be able to play or research and development. And any successful corporation, a for-profit corporation, is going to have a robust R&D department, right? That's how they're going to innovate and, and fail and learn. And if the funding community can do that for the nonprofit community, specifically, you know, Jewish nonprofits, is like robustly fund research and development and create an environment where it is okay to play and to experiment and to fail, that actually what ends up happening is that you have to fund R&D less because the nonprofits learn what works and what doesn't because they're given that freedom to do that. And so I just want to really like pin that, that um, so much of this in the nonprofit you know, sector depends on funders being willing to kind of give that openness to research and development funding. Amen. Yeah, I can jump in there. And um, I just playing off what you're saying, Jenny, I think that the innovation sector, you know, I, I think at Wilderness Store is still on the cutting edge. Um, and, you know, soon we'll have like buildings on the ground, God willing. But um, I think, you know, especially in the first decade of Wilderness Torah, we were trying something pretty new. Um, what does it mean to do Jewish cultural experiences entirely outdoors? You know, the reform study on God connection um, demonstrated a really stunning statistic that 60% of reform Jews in that study, at least, connected most with God in nature. May not be a surprise, but but we do most of Judaism indoors. So Wilderness Torah um, was one of the first organizations to just do, Jew it's not an environmental organization, it's Jewish community organization reconnecting Jewish tradition to nature. So we, we did that. And, um, you know, we, we learned a lot of things. We made a bunch of mistakes and then we thrived. Um, and I, I know early on, for example, with our Bar and Bat Mitzvah program, it's called the Nature. 
It's a nature-based rite of passage program. Local synagogues in the Bay Area, some of them didn't want to talk to us. We're, 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 we're afraid of competition. But we, we designed the program to be a supplemental program. So we left the traditional Hebrew Torah prayer piece for our local synagogue, and we, we did something else. We did nature connection, challenges, uh, very life-centered exploring of what it means with, with, a, with a rite of passage ceremony that looks nothing like the being on the bima in a synagogue. So kids, some kids ended up doing both, their local synagogue experience, as well as, no, no. <laughs> that's my, my two-year-old daughter, um, who someday will do the nature, God willing. And what we found was that we, um, we had ingredients that synagogue life didn't have, for example. And now, 14 years into it, we're partnering with, organ with, with other communities. I think that the synagogue establishment in the Bay Area, for example, is essential. I think that, and, you know, and uh, so, and what we're doing is new and refreshing and I think also essential. Another example, during the pandemic, uh, Congregation uh, Temple Emmanuel in San Francisco, it's the biggest reform synagogue in San Francisco, um, they had a really challenging time during COVID because uh, their enrollment in Sunday school dropped by a very large percentage. Now they reached out to us and said, hey, you know, we hear you do great work. Um, we've been tracking y'all. Would you mind coming and offering something inside of uh, Congregation Emmanuel uh, during COVID? So we brought Bechutz, which is our, sun, our forest Sunday school into Congregation Emmanuel. We served a hundred kids um, and it was amazing. Those families got served, just their third and fourth graders. It was an experiment. They got served um, we got business, we, we got to impact people. And now, even as COVID is God willing winding down, we are moving forward now with our two organizations building on that partnership and Wilderness Tour is gonna be offering part of the Emmanuel's Sunday School. And uh, you know, we hope that we will both thrive because of that. And the last example I would say is in the case of uh, Camp Newman, you know, they uh, are rebuilding after burning down completely and asking a lot of hard questions like, what do we do in a fire uh, prone area? And Wilderness Torah is long envisioned being on land. So we're building a partnership um, with Jewish values focused on climate change at the center of that partnership. That is something that neither of our organizations could have done alone. Um, so we're leveraging um, something innovative with something well-established and building something that's way beyond the sum of its parts. And I think that is you know, the ultimate goal of what we might call more established Judaism um, and you know what the innovation sector is bringing. It, it, it has to be like this, and I think it, it, it is, and I appreciate the conversation. I, I love that. I love hearing that taking the entire Jewish community to the next level by partnership, right? Like there's, it's so easy to offer these, operate in silos. And um, when a new organization kind of comes to town for, for folks to feel maybe like threatened or you're gonna take my, my constituents, but the way you're approaching it is like the more, the more, and that um, that just that just lands really well um, for for young people, for for people who have been connected to their communities for a long time. It just it just works, um, and that's really exciting. And I also went to Camp Newman, so that's really cool. Um, yeah, and, I think Karen. Yeah. Like I think also, you know, we we focus there's been a lot of focus now on the, you know, the unaffiliated and not even just unaffiliated people who were grew up Jewish, but really did nothing. Right. And all of a sudden are coming, are coming back to it. And, and I think that what's so important about our three organizations and other organizations is it, it brings them in. And it, so even more so on another level, it doesn't have to be a competition, right? It's so for us, when we talk about interfaith or we talk about the B'nai Mitzvah program, um, we don't have a lot of rules in place, right? And, and again, there are other organizations, there are other synagogues, they have set rules, right? And, and that's okay too, um, that's what works for them. But for us, we wanna be that access point for people who are trying to find that connection. So if they come and say, listen, my kid is 14 and wants a B'nai Mitzvah, what do I do? I say, great, let's start. What, I mean, what do you mean? What do we do? Let's start. Let's start teaching them whatever it is they need to, to learn. Um, and I think that that's where the structural change, and especially for us, because our structure is so different, it allows for that. It gives us the freedom to say to a 14-year-old, yeah, come on in. 
right? Like I don't need to put you in into, we don't have a Hebrew school. We don't have a religious school. We have different programs that kids can slide into and um, whatever it is that they want their experience to be and whatever the parents want their experience to be, they can come in and sort of piece it together. And that structure allows us to be more of a welcoming, open community that people can access any point in their lives. And I, oh, that, yeah, sorry, you talk about our multi-faith community. One of the things that struck me and in the research that the Leech Tech Foundation did when getting ready to purchase the property is that certainly in our community here, people's identities were very bifurcated. So like I'm an environmentalist, I'm interested in social justice. Um, I like spending out time outdoors with my family and my Judaism is over here in a separate box. And so you alluded to it, Gabby, a little bit like, you know, I'm not very Jewish. I'm not a good Jew. We hear that. I'm not Jewish enough. We hear that all the time. And yet what, what our community, I think, didn't realize is that they were living Jewishly without realizing that, right? By taking care of the land, by standing up for others, by, you know, volunteering their time, they were living Jewish lives. And so I think, you know, part of what we've helped is to draw that connection. Like you are living Jewishly doing just what you're doing. And we meet them where they're at with that and then hopefully grow and expand from there. I love that. You guys all kind of spoke about accessing uh, the unaffiliated, or I like to say yet to be affiliated. Um, and, and that's just, you know, for every organization, it's like, how do we reach the unreachable, the, the folks who we don't even know exist? And, and each of you have had real success in doing that. What do you attribute your success to? I mean, I, I can start, I mean, I think it goes back to my days when I was working for a grant from the Leech Tide Foundation, working for JFS, and I was a North County outreach social worker, and we would go out to public spaces and like do an olive oil tasting at Hanukkah, and, you know, go, go into um, these spaces, and I, I kind of what I alluded to, I heard over and over again, which is like, well, I'm Jewish, but it's not something I talk about or, you know, so really just removing that stigma and giving people a way to connect to their Judaism that is already aligned with the things that they're already doing and already interested in. So for example, at the high, whether that be someone who's really into movies or interesting Netflix shows on, you know, Israeli culture then that's sort of an entry point into, you know, discussing, you know, connecting with your Jewish community that way. And then hopefully we move people along a spectrum so that they're, they're you know, we've had this debate. Is, is your Jewishness attending a Jewish movie? Well, no, but hopefully that's getting you connected to a community that then maybe sparks your interest to attend a Shabbat dinner. And then maybe that sparks your interest to attend a study group, or then maybe you go on to JCO. So, um, I think, again, just helping people weave that connection that they are already living that Jewish life, but reducing the stigma. Yeah, I think for us, um, we're not, we're not great at advertising. Like that's not our thing. We, we don't, you know, we don't have a huge like social media or put ads in magazines. We really focus on, first of all, continuing to build a strong core. And when I say core, I would say, you know, our core is 75% of our congregation at least, right? Like that's how strong it is. And so you have that strong core that then goes out into their different other communities. Um, so that's number one. The other thing is we, we really try to not limit ourselves to um, the bubble of the Jewish community. We are involved in a lot of other organizations um, where we've created relationships. Um, and so if someone within, let's say the church that we have um, a relationship with, and we have gotten a few people that way, um, meet someone that says they're Jewish, but they haven't really found a place, that's an advocate for us. That's someone out there that's saying, you know, there's a place called Jewish Collaborative and, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So that's kind of, we have people in the community all throughout that are just there. And when the conversation comes up, they're able to, uh, to bring people towards us. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I, I would say um, for Wilderness Tour, we get... Um, <laughs> a lot of interruptions today. Uh, we get people saying after a Wilderness Tour event, wow, this is Judaism and I didn't know that. Um, now I, I have a place. And so I have to go to people like that and say, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, explain to me what your experience is. Um, and they say, well, um, you know, I've never been uh, in a communal space that was um, so age diverse. I've never been in a communal space that was so nature-based. Uh, I've never been in a communal space that was so vibrant and multifaceted. How are you doing that? Um, and we're, we're, we're approaching Jewish life from this holistic, people-centered, community-driven experience where it's, it, it, it has a wholeness to it. Um, I think that, uh, and I think that we are responding to some, some brokenness in the world. And I don't, I don't just mean in the Jewish community, but I mean in the world, modernity is marked by um, certain kind of brokennesses. We are, we are disconnected from the natural world. Um, I think that is pretty safe to say, a lot of us at least, um, certainly uh, our institutions. Um, we are largely disconnected within generations. People live in silos, age silos. People don't wanna live in age silos. Uh, they, they may not even realize that's what's going on until they, they enter a space that is not age silo and they're like, whoa, I'm in a space where I can connect with someone younger than me and someone older than me and, and relate, huh? Um, and so, you know, they're, I would say people come and they experience a healing in terms of um, what they didn't know they could experience in Jewish spaces. And, you know, I, I saw that, um, I think Gabby, in, 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 your, in your, your image there, you know, like a very multi-generational space together. And, I, and that, that, that's exciting for people. Um, and I also think that uh, we are, moving out and Reb Zalman, I want to invoke Reb Zalman, uh, Rabbi Zalman Shakta Shalomi, you know, he, he died just in 2014 and his, he said a blessing. And one of the things that he spoke about frequently in his later years was at the time of the, of the Rebbe, you know, of the singular, often male, but he wasn't just talking about gender. He was talking about the, the, the single leader who kind of holds it all together. That time is ending. That had a 2000 year history. It is ending. What is now coming online is something that is oriented towards collective leadership, collective experiences. And that's what's going to happen. And you might want to, you might want to consider on what that means for your leadership, you know, when you're teaching rabbis as a rabbi or to community leaders as a community leader. But if you don't get on that train, eventually you're going to miss the train. And I think that is one of the big things that I'm hearing uh, in this, co this conversation at large. And that's one thing that Wilderness Tour is doing really well. And people feel it. And they're like, wow, I want to be a part of this. That, that's a big one. Zalig, you are speaking my language on so many levels. And, and I, you know, I think, again, if we're talking other structures that exist, we're, especially when we're talking the top down, right? You have the clergy, you have the educators, you have all the, the people who are hired by the synagogue, by the board. They are paid to give a service. And so it is transactional. Here's my money. Um, you give me what I need. And it doesn't work anymore. It, it now is, it's a place where, and I always say, I am the rabbi of my community, but I am also a part of my community. I am another person within the community. And one of the beauties of the Jewish collaborative that a lot of my clergy friends are very jealous of is they have spent four years at least taking more and more off my plate so that I can be the spiritual leader. And now I'm in that place where I have the space to do my own work and I do my work and then I'm able to bring that in as the spiritual leader. Do I uh, get involved in what chairs we buy? No, but there are people in the congregation who that's really important to, right? They, that's what they love, right? They love making a place beautiful. Um, and so that's what they do. And there are people who love setting up a room to, um, to celebrate a holiday. And so they do that. And even our board, they are our board. That is their role. They don't, they're not here right? Like they are part, they are within the circle. And I think that 
that aspect is so important because when you have that hierarchy, um, first of all, so much falls on the rabbi and the cantor and the educator and you know the staff that they get burnt out and they lose their way. Like I've worked in synagogues where I've lost my spiritual way. And how can I be a spiritual leader if I'm losing my own spirituality? Um, and so what Zelig, what you're saying as far as, you know, just the, the community based and um, it, it's exactly it. I think that's exactly it. Um, there are so many times that we meet with students at Hillel and they go, there's like this Jewish guilt. It's like in our blood, like I'm a bad Jew, like, oh, I'm Jew, like my mom's Jewish, but like, I'm not really Jewish. And they, they have this perception of what Jewish should be. And because they don't fit into that box, then they kind of remove themselves from, from Jewish community because they don't feel like they're a part of it. And what I think is really special about each of your organizations is that you you give permission to be Jewish however Jewish feels for that each unique individual it's this inclusiveness that um unfortunately might have not been a part of their their traditional Jewish experience or it was and they have evolved and that's not really where they are um I, I'm hearing that you're you're really meeting people where they are emotionally and spiritually and saying whatever that looks like to you um that's cool with us and I think that some of us can learn from that and to to embrace that you know there are I you know I get parents that are like oh my gosh what if she doesn't marry someone Jewish and there's this real fear of Jewish continuity but what Jewish looks like now is different and what it looks like in 10 years is going to be different. Mixed heritage couples are, are no longer the outlier, they're part of the norm. And so as a Jewish community, we need to involve them and embrace what diversity within the Jewish community looks like in order to, to continue to be successful. And I think each of you have really figured that out um, for your own communities. Can I jump on one thing, Karen? Yeah. Um, my colleague, Jordan Daniels, I was at a conference, um, a virtual conference for the Bay Area. I was telling um, Zelig and Gabby and Jordan, this, this statement of Jordan's was repeated over and over again because it's really brilliant. You know, we talk so much about inclusivity at the Jewish community, in the Jewish community. We want to be inclusive. We want to be inclusive. Well, what that means is I, you know, and I, and I'm quoting Jordan you are welcome to come to my house and I'm going to feel well, I'm going to make you feel welcome in my own house, which is a very nice sentiment. But what we really want is to go beyond that and create a sense of belonging, which is let's create the house together. And I think that's something that we're really committed to. And Gabby, I think is obviously kind of fundamental to Jayco and who you are as well. And it sounds like wilderness tour as well. But I think that just that word inclusivity, challenging ourselves to go beyond that to creating a sense of belonging is really important. Yeah, one of my congregants, I talked about inclusivity during the high holidays and during high holiday services, because we're interactive, called me out on it and said, if you're using the word inclusive, that means that um, somebody's excluded. Um, and so I really took that to heart. Um, we, we are known as the, um, the rebel whispers. And when I say rebels, I mean people who, like Jenny said, put up that wall of like, eh, Judaism is not for me. Um, so we'll very often have, um, you know, one, one partner of a relationship really want to get involved and say, just so you know, my partner's not really into this. They're not going to get involved. And we bring them in. We had one guy who just liked to do security during high holidays. That's all he wanted to do. He was like, let me sit outside and let me provide this service for you. I will, you know, help with all that kind of stuff. We had one person who um, really just wanted to play games. And so we started a game night and that's, that was his access point. Our first chairman came on because he was a businessman. He was not affiliated with Judaism, really didn't see himself as a very devout Jew. He is now what I consider one of our Torah scholars, right? And it was because all those access points are open and non-judge, there is no judgment. Whatever it is, however you wanna be involved, that is your way. And when the judgment is taken out of the picture, 
that's when that space is open for people to explore more. As soon as you judge, as soon as you say, this is how it's supposed to be, those walls are going to be put up and they're going to stay behind the wall and say, well, you know, I'm just, this is who I am. But if you can open that space and they can explore Torah and they can explore nature and they can explore all these different ways to connect to community and Judaism, that's when they start to really figure out their own Jewish identity, not the Jewish identity that we place on them. I love that. I'm into that. Um, so, okay, time is running out and I wanna be respectful of all of your time. I know it kind of breezed by. Um, we have one person that asked, um, you know, this, this is both leash tag and um, Jayco are in North County. Are there opportunities in, in more central um, San Diego? And, and what is the potential there? I mean, I think that's a, I think, you know, certainly I was just looking what Ollie put in the chat, which is like Coastal Roots Farm is, is um, not, you know, it's in Encinitas, but certainly open accessible to uh, our entire community. And I think it would be a dream to think of every Jewish, you know, every city having a Jewish community farm at the center of it. Certainly that would be something we would be very excited about. Um, and in fact, you know, Leach Tag has done a lot of field building work in that way. Um, and I think that a lot of the traditional institutions, I mean, if you're talking about a farm, maybe not, but like a lot of the traditional institutions are doing really creative things outside of the walls of their buildings. And so some of it is just paying attention to what's happening, you know, the, Center for Jewish Culture at the JCC, they're doing incredible programming and it's not all, you know, they're based in, in La Jolla, but sometimes you have to find them out in the community as well. Um, so I think that those things are there. You just, um, I know someone put the JCC is central and has so much to offer. There are so many levels of creativity happening there and we partner very close with them. Um, okay, just one last question. So it is um, 2021 this year. In 20. 31, what would you envision for the future of the Jewish community? Zella, you can answer California collectively, but um, for Gabby and, and Jenny, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you envision for our, our collective future. Uh, I can go first. Um, our collective future, boy, I think one, um, one thing that I would love to see in our collective future is that um, there's a sense of um, what's called empowerment, uh, meaning people feel like, you know, they have their hands on the steering wheel of their spiritual and communal lives. Um, the other thing I would say, I would love to see uh, a community that is less siloed, like I spoke earlier, and feels more like a village. In Wilderness Store, we use the word village building all the time. And what, what do we mean by that? You know, if you conceptualize the village, uh, different kinds of communities, different kinds of time periods, it, it, it meant we were, um, we were really connected. I mean, it's all about connection. So what would it mean to really truly be connected uh, regionally and relationally? Um, so that the bar about mitzvah isn't just about um, someone doing the ceremony in front of the community, which by the way, there's a greater percentage of kids that think that's a graduation from Judaism than an initiation into their new way of being in Judaism. That's a problem. I think if we had the village, it would feel differently because they're being welcomed into something that they get to be a part of. They get, they get to be mentored by. And as they come of age, they turn and start mentoring those who are coming up. Like that's the kind of connection that I'm looking for. So, you know, it all comes down to true deep connection, whether that's humans in the natural world, humans to humans across generations, across race, across gender, across sex, sexual orientation. This is the times that it's calling us forward. Um, and I would say that we also have to um, seriously look at Jewish values and how to confront the social and ecological ills of our time together as villages. Otherwise, what's the point? So I, I would add that to the mix. We're so you want us to focus on, because Zelig did a beautiful job I, I would say even globally, we can take that. Um, San Diego, I mean, 
you know, it's hard. We're in North County. Um, so we do feel, um, I mean, we have the hive, which is a great place. That's like where we feel like that's like the JCC for us in North County. You know, it's like our, it's like our hub. It's the place where people can go, um, for all sorts of programs. I, I think that, um, what I'd love to see for San Diego is just more of the breaking down of the walls, just more congregations and organizations just coming together, um, doing, you know, celebrating together, having days where we just all get together and even share what our communities are doing, right? Like have an exchange of ideas and um, and and so I'd like to see more of that. Um, I think that as far as like thinking spiritually, um, our main goal is to take Torah and see it again as this, just this, this round sphere that everyone can sort of see from different perspectives and that every perspective is just as valuable as the next. And I think that um, within the San Diego Jewish community, there are so many different perspectives of Judaism and we can all learn from each other and we can all take from each other and grow. And so I'd like to see more of that. Yes, the San Diego village. Let's do it. Let's create it at the hive. <laughs> Gladly. We'd be happy to host it. Um, you know, I know that the pandemic really, I mean, there was, there are so many silver linings and a few that I hope to keep with us. One is the access, the, the people that we were able to involve in our programs who probably would have never braved the traffic to come up to our property, um, or it's too hard to leave the house after dinner time, and we were able to get them in the evening for an online program. How cool is that? Or that we were able to share. I mean, we have so many incredible um, connections across the country and the world of, of Jewish thought leaders and performers, and we were able to bring those to our San Diego com community in this virtual space. And the level of collaboration during this past year has been more genuine than I've ever seen in my time working in the San Diego Jewish community. So while, you know, maybe you put logos on each other's things and you, sh you know, do some of that, this was, I mean, like we, the Hive really worked hand in hand with the Center for Jewish Culture over the past year to say, you're offering online arts and culture programs, so are we, let's do it hand in hand so that the community has a menu of offerings that's well coordinated. So we're not hammering them with the same types of programs at the same time that are in competition. And to the points that we made before, no one was ever stealing an audience from someone else. We were just saying, if we plan thoughtfully in advance together, we can serve the whole community so much better. So I would love to see that level of collaboration and just take our lessons, bring it into this hybrid world, which is I think the world will have to be living in. And to anyone who wants to utilize you know, our space, we have lots of gorgeous outdoor space that can be very COVID safe. Amazing. Well. We are two minutes on the hour and I wanted to thank each of you. I know I was inspired by what you had to say and I'm really optimistic that some of the collaborative um, trials that we've been able to, to try during COVID will, will continue to apply after, um, after we're able to, to kind of go back, not go back, go forward into, into the future. And um, I wanted to thank you for allowing me to, to be your facilitator and um, for sharing your heart and your spirit with all of us. Um, thank you so much, Karen, for moderating. Um, and thank you um, to our amazing panelists. This was a, this was a terrific discussion. I think everyone can um, feel very positive about the Jewish future hearing um, the three of you speak. Um, it, you know, it's going to continue to change and adapt and yet your um, inspirational words and the way you're operating is very resonant and is going to work um, to, to help create a beautiful uh, Jewish communities going forward. So thank you, uh, Rabbi Gabby, Gabby, Rabbi Zelig and Jenny for, um, for a wonderful presentation today. Um, and we will look forward to continuing these discussions on and on and on. So thank you everyone for your time. And uh, we'll be following up after the presentation um, with, with an email with some follow-up information. 
Um, but until uh, next time, thank you all.